Well, thank you so much for coming here today. Uh, it's a great pleasure. All right. So, um, so let's talk about programming and uh, the world we live in. Um, so some of us have been programming for a few years. Some of us have been programming for a few decades. And one of the reasons that I really get excited about programming is when I started programming, uh, I started programming for the art and science and math in programming, honestly. That's what kind of drew me in. And after I started programming for a few years, I, I realized that I want to continue to program. And one of the reasons was the art in programming. And, and that just really drew me in because uh, programming is not just engineering. Programming is not just art. It is one of those fields that's a clear combination of these two things. And, and when you sit down and write code, it's a form of expression where you're able to convey a certain idea in a certain way. And it's kind of like a poem that you write if you think about it. Uh, if you go to somebody and say, write a poem about something, whatever the topic is, no two person may be writing the same poem for the same topic. And even the same person, what's intriguing is, you can go to the same person and two years later, ask them to write a poem about the same topic, and they're not going to write the same thing. And programming is a lot like that. It's a form of expression, and we are trying to really convey our ideas. But of course, we are seeing a, a change in the world we live in, and we see programming languages come, programming languages that are there evolve. So what do we really see in front of us? Well, they say that the things are changing really fast in the computer world. And we see hear this all the time, isn't it? Uh, people will always say, wow, everything is changing in the programming world. Everything is changing in the software world all the time. And uh, you know, how fast are things really changing? That's what I want to really talk about. Well, if you think about uh, systems, um, I started my career programming in uh, mainframe computers. And uh, you log on to those machines. You don't even know where those machines are located. And then you log on to those machines and you interact with them. And then, you, you know, over the years, I saw personal computers come up. Uh, come up. And then we went on from there to uh, handle devices, to uh, smartphones. And now things are back, everything on the cloud. And you see the trend in the hardware world going pretty rapidly, as we see. And now we are even working with devices that are computing, but we don't even see. These could be micro devices embedded someplace as well. But then that reminds me of an experience I had with my, with my son. Uh, I was going to the store with him. And when my wife pointed out that on the shelf at the store was the, was the correction fluid. And uh, for some reason, we kind of stood there and talked about this correction fluid. And as we were talking about it, obviously, my wife and I share a context with this. And my son interrupted and said, uh, excuse me, uh, what's a correction fluid? And uh, I, I told him, well, a correction fluid is what you use uh, to correct things you type. So if you type on something and you mistype it, you take the correction fluid and you, you know, uh, paint on it. And then it went, once it dries, you type over it. And he painfully listened to everything I said. And he said, uh, but how do you type on a paper? I don't know what that means. And I was very thrilled to immediately jump in and say, oh, did you know that when dad had to go to college, uh, I had an honors thesis to write, and it was grandma who wrote the thesis for dad because dad didn't know typing at the time, and grandma typed the entire uh, thesis at the time on a typewriter. And then he looked at me and said, what's a typewriter? And, and that's when I realized that I am here with a generation that doesn't even know a technology even existed that I grew up with. And all I did was, I didn't answer him what a typewriter was. I ran home before he could get home, and I was hiding all my floppy disk I had in my closet, because what would he then think if he ever finds this out? And, and this is kind of, it fascinates me to see how generations of technologies have come and gone, and, and people in, in today's world would kind of look at you strange and say, what in the world is that? Like I once used to look at people when I was young, when they used to talk about technologies that I don't use. And at least, you know, I was in the border of those technologies. I was born, but the distance is pretty uh, amazing today if you really think about it. Well, from that point of view, we can see that things are progressing very quickly in, in the world we live in. 
A lot of things have changed in the last about 50 years in the computing world. We can all agree to it. So much that I realized the other day, I travel around the world, and, and one of the benefits of traveling around the world is you get to meet people with various types of devices around the airports. Every corner you turn, people are doing something or the other with their devices. And, and I uh, saw how much the world has changed. Once upon a time, I used to work in systems where this, this big mic mainframe computers would take twice the size of this room and generate more heat than we can imagine. But today, more power than those mainframe computers are held in our handle devices. We carry in our pockets more computing power than entire buildings once were able to host in terms of computer systems. And I realized at that instance, looking at everybody around me, and I came to a very interesting realization. And that realization is, I admire the human quest to create new powerful devices so fellow humans have the options like never before to play solitaire. And that's what I see people do with all this computing power is everywhere I go, I'm very curious. What are they doing with all these devices? Oh, they're playing solitaire. And, and this is unbelievable, right? If you look at 300, 400 years ago, when we didn't have computers, we did as astronomy. We were able to locate where the planets are. And with all this computing power we have now, we'll play, we play solitaire. Go figure, right? This just amazes me. But anyway, who are we to tell what to do with these devices? But it's amazing how much computing power we have on our hands, if you will think about it. So the world is changing pretty rapidly. But how are we really programming in the new century? That's the question to ask. Moving forward, how are we really programming in the new century? And if you really think about it, my goodness, the devices are different, the world is different, we're doing big data right now, and we are dealing with uh, 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 data flow computing, we're dealing with systems that are constantly up and running, and we have devices that monitor maybe patients' health or uh, health of other systems. How do we really program moving forward into the new century? And, and, and to answer that question, I started looking at a lot of code that developers are programming, and I came up with one consistent code they all seem to write, and that is this one right here. And if you look at this, like, really? And with a good old for loop, I would give you a challenge when you get back to your work tomorrow, do a quick check on this, run a grep to find out how many places you're using a for in your code. It's kind of scary, isn't it? And we are, we've been programming in the imperative style for such a very long time. And this is a lot of moving parts in the code for us to deal with. This becomes really an accidental complexity, and that becomes really expensive to maintain the code over time. Uh, here's a quick thought. How many of you ever work from home? where you write code at home. A few, quite a few of us. I got a word of caution for you. Be very careful. Because when you're programming, if a kid runs into the room, you have to shut down the computer very quickly. Otherwise, they look at your code and say, that's what you do for a living? And they get really you know, uh, anxious that they don't want to take after a profession after that. If the code is so low level and verbose, why would anybody want to do that? So we have to really ask the question, are we raising the level of abstraction to be able to meet the challenges of the future? So, but some things are very fundamental and they are really hard for us to change. And that's just the way, the nature of things. For example, uh, almost every single program out there that we care to use is Turing complete. But the problem with Turing completeness is one thing. You, are, you can proudly say that a language is Turing complete, and if a language is Turing complete, what does that really tell us? It tells us that we can use that language to solve almost every problem in computing we are interested in solving, just like you use any other language. But one of the biggest challenges with Turing completeness is Turing completeness doesn't say anything about performance. Turing completeness says nothing about efficiency. Turing completeness says absolutely nothing about elegance. 
It doesn't say anything about maintainability. It doesn't say anything about complexity. So our Turing completeness is a very low bar when it comes to a programming language quality. Just because a language is uh, Turing complete doesn't really mean a whole lot other than saying, yes, you can use the language for writing your application, but there's a lot more involved in it. We still are dealing with the architectural limitations that was once created. The von Neumann model like, is something we have to deal with constantly as we develop applications, and that poses limitations on what we can carry through. This is one of the reasons why we have to really scale horizontally to be able to really get the power of computing, and that changes a certain things we're gonna do in the future moving forward as well. Let's think about this for a minute. What year was object-oriented programming introduced? Uh, take a wild guess. Don't worry about being wrong or being right. I'm wrong most of the time myself. Anyone get, can guess. What year was OP introduced? 70s. 1970s? 80s. Fairly good. 80s. What was it? 86. 86? 70s. 70s. Well, okay, pretty close. OOP was introduced in 1967 by Dahl and Nygaard. Now, 1967 is these, these two gentlemen, Norwegians, uh, created this concept, the idea of object-oriented programming. And, and they demonstrated for the very first time this idea of creating a system that we now call as object-oriented. I remember as a very young programmer sitting and reading those news groups back in time. We didn't have blogs, we didn't have Twitter back in time, but we had these news groups. And constant fighting on these news groups. One group of people telling, object under programming sucks, don't ever use it. And another group of programming telling us, OOP is beautiful and it is great and it's awesome, you should use it. And all this fighting going on through the 80s and suddenly all that quieted out. Nobody complained about OOP after that. And everybody started quietly using it. I'm going to say that year approximately is 1990, 86 to 90. So it turned out that what was introduced in 1967 became mainstream in 1990. What was that? 23 years. If OOP was a human being, it had a terrible neglected childhood. Nobody wanted anything with it. Until it was 23 years, hey handsome, do you want to hang around with us now? And, and can you imagine 23 years for something to really take root? Well, that brings us to functional programming. Well, what was the very first functional programming language created? It was Lisp. Lisp was created back in 1950s. This is nearly 17 years before object-oriented programming was even thought about. And, and 1950s is when the first object functional programming language was created, but functional programming itself is based off Lambda Calculus. When was Lambda Calculus created? Well, everyone here knows of Alan Turing. This was Alan Turing's professor, Alonzo Church, and Alonzo Church introduced Lambda calculus in 1930s. Can you imagine, 90 years ago, this idea was introduced, and we are just about getting warmed up. And people are like, oh, should we use functional programming? So when people ask me and tell me that things change really fast in the area of software, I always ask them the question, what are you smoking? It has taken us 90 years and 20 years and 30 years to make change. And it doesn't change as fast as we think it does. Definitely not. It takes a very long time for us to change what we do. Surprisingly, the hardware world changes pretty rapidly. The business world changes pretty rapidly. The programming world, we take our sweet time. It takes 20, 30 years to change. But the question to ask really is, why? Why does it take 10 years? Why does it take 15 years? Why does it take 20 years? And it got me thinking, why are we taking so long to really adopt? 
Well, it takes a lot of time to adopt for some real good reasons. Well, a beautiful quote by Santayana, he says, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So this is one of the reasons why we should look at the past before we can look at the future. Otherwise, we're going to fall into the same traps as people before us ended up in. And, and so programmers don't adapt too well. Programmers, and when I talk about programmers, I want to make sure that we understand what that means. I am not talking about the person next to you. Because you can turn to the person next to you and say, hey, do you adapt really quickly? And the person next to you is going to say, yeah, of course I do. But you and I are not the programmers of the world in that context. There are a good, I don't know, what, 10 million programmers using Java today? Maybe even more number of millions of programmers out there. You are here on a sa Sunday morning. Sunday. Saturday morning. <laughs> yes. I, I just wanted to check. Yeah. Sorry. Saturday morning. We are here on a Saturday morning. Uh, in fact, we don't even know what morning it is. That's awesome. <laughs> so we are here on a Sunday morning talking about technology. This only tells you two things, right? A, you have no life. And B, you are absolutely passionate about what you do. This completely rules you out compared to the millions of programmers over there who don't care about most of this stuff. And so when I say programmers don't adapt too quickly, I'm not talking about the outliers that, that the programmers we often interact with. I'm talking about the traditional corporate programmers that are out there. They don't want to adapt too quickly. And they predominantly program in one language and are very happy not to be disturbed about it. So they don't adapt too well. And also, we take changes in byte size. Have you ever thought about why the syntax of Java is so much like the syntax of C++? Why is the syntax of C++ so much like the syntax of C? Why is the for loop in C so much like for loop in other languages that came before it. And the answer is extremely simple. You don't want to change a lot of things in front of programmers, you just change one little thing. And when you give a bite size change, the adoption is a lot easier. When you do drastic changes, you get a pushback. And, and it's really hard to make those changes. So the language designers often are very mindful of this. If you look at, I'm not talking about the quality of languages right now. I'm talking about adoption of languages and the popularities of languages. Just like in politics, just because somebody is popular or something is popular doesn't mean that's the best thing. So the question really is, why are these languages adopted more frequently? Why are those languages popular? Why do a lot of people use it? And there's a reason for it, because the adoption is gradual towards them. They've been giving this bite-sized improvements. That's one thing. The other thing I realized was that it is, it's, 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 habits really change hard. It takes a new generation for changes to happen. This reminds me of an experience I would never forget. I was speaking in a conference. I was keynoting in a conference. I finished my keynote, and I came down, and I sat down on the chair right after my keynote as they started another, you know, something else. And there was a lady sitting there in the chair next to me, and she looked at me and said, hey, thanks for the talk, that was really great. I said, oh, thank you very much. And immediately she said, I've been working in the industry for two years, and I have a master's in computer uh, science. You know, if somebody has, has a master's degree in computer science and has worked in the industry for two years, you don't have to be a you know, genius to figure out how old this lady is. So I kind of have an idea of how old she is already. And then she looks at me and says, could I ask you a personal question? I said, no, 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 we don't do personal questions. Thanks for coming to the conference. I'm glad you enjoyed the talk. We are done. And she said, no, 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 please. I really liked your talk. I'm just absolutely fascinated. Just allow me to ask one personal question to you. I said, I'm really not good at personal questions, but you know what? Fine, go ahead, what's your question? And she said, what year did you graduate from college? I said, no, we're not doing this. No, no, we're not gonna do this. Thanks for coming, we're done. She's like, no, 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 please just answer this one question for me. And I said, okay, fine. And I told her the year I graduated. 
And as soon as I mention the year, her face just blossoms and she's like, really? That's the year I was born. And I just looked at her and said, could you do me a favor? She said, what? I said, could you reach over the cane for me? I need some help walking. Because all of a sudden I realized, here I'm sitting, sitting next to a colleague in the industry, and she was born after I had graduated from college. And, and then I, that evening I was sitting in my room thinking about it, and I was absolutely thrilled to realize that this is amazing. Because I am the old guy in the room suddenly. And there's this young person who comes into the field and questions everything I do. And asks the question, but why are you doing this? And the constraints that held, held me back are not the constraints that hold her back anymore. Just like the constraints that held back people before me are not the constraints that held me back. Much like how I question how things were done, there is a younger generation of people coming and questioning how I am doing things. And all of a sudden I realized this is just amazing because every 10 years we have a new generation coming into the field. The children who are in school today will be part of our profession in less than five to 10 years. And to me, that is just amazing because as time goes on, these young people come over and push the rest of us a little aside. And they take over and say, let me tell you how we can do things. And they change the status quo. And I realized this is phenomenal because this is just amazing the way nature really is. Because that night I realized that nature fundamentally has a built-in automatic garbage collector. And every 10 years, it pushes some of us out and brings back a next generation into it. And to me, this is just absolutely rewarding because that tells us we have hope. We will never be stagnated in what we do and there'll be better ways to do things in the future as future comes through. And so this is one of the reasons why there is a next generation of developers that come in every 10 years and change the way we do things. And I think that's pretty rewarding. But we are poised for some really big changes right now. But it, but it turns out those changes actually started about 10 years ago. And, and in fact, to be precise, around 2003 to 2006 time frame, maybe about 12 years ago. But what are some of the changes? Where did, the, where did these come from? Well, we are living in two different, very significant changes right now. One of them is the hardware changes. This started happening around 2003 time frame when we realized we have to really start producing multi-core processors. We couldn't package into the same core, same processor anymore. Imagine the day when an engineer walked up to his boss and said it ran really fast before it melted and they had to really start putting in multi-core processors, and, and that is the way we went. And this completely shifted the way we think about multi-threading, for example. The second biggest change we have in our field is in the computing world, in the business world. We are talking about big data. We're talking about systems we are developing. Back in time, we developed applications for a very small group of people to use those applications. Those users are called captive users. Today we are building applications for real world users to use. We are not giving applications to employees, we are giving applications to our customers for them to use moving forward. And this is a very different scale and that has a very different demand. We want responsiveness, we want performance, we want reliability on these systems. We are talking about systems that monitor patients' health. We're talking about systems that monitor health of anybody. You have your smart devices that can transmit your data to your doctors and other people. I'm not saying all of that is good, but it's doing this already. And we are talking about devices that are monitored, airplanes that are monitored while it's flying, it's a very different world we live in in the business world, and, and the computing demands are very different. So the hardware world has changed, the business world has changed. It's time for us to really rethink about how we program the software. So there's a modern demands, there's cloud computing, there's big data, there's microservices, there's the internet of things, and we have machine learning, AI, 
so on and so forth, so many things demanding how we do things. And we already have some answers for this already. We have seen innovations related to NoSQL, MapReduce algorithms, reactive programming, a lot of things have changed, but where do we really need to go? I am looking specifically at Java, and I'll be honest about it. I am one of those guys on the other side of the picket line, constantly complaining that Java sucks. And I was one of those people. I used to get threats in the email. People will write email to me and say, Venkat, I hate you because you hate Java. I used to get such emails. And all that changed for me when I saw Java 8. Because Java 8 was the first time I even liked Java. Because the minute I saw what Java 8 did, Java 8 gave not just the lambdas, not just the functional style of programming, Java gave the efficiency of stream API. And that was very rewarding when I saw that. I said, wow, that's really amazing. And I got hooked on to Java. And then I saw what Java is going through. And I'm going to say Java is going to change more in the next five years compared to the past 20 years. And the biggest change in Java is coming ahead of us. And what I want to talk about today is not what's in Java, but what's going to be in Java. But I'm not going to just talk about it, but I'm going to show it to you from other languages. And Java is learning very actively from a lot of other languages. The designers of Java made it very clear. They're not interested in introducing things into Java that may not work. Because Java doesn't have the luxury of what a lot of other languages do. Java is special. If you take a lot of different languages, I have the deepest respect for a lot of other languages. Those languages, those designers of those languages will experiment features in them. And they'll put out something and wait for two to three years. Programmers start using it. And they will say, oh, I love it. Or they would say, this sucks, it doesn't work. And they will remove the features that don't work and put in other features. But those programmers using those innovative languages are extremely passionate and patient. When the language changes everything, those programmers will say, oh, I love it. I can go to work tomorrow and change all my code. Thank you. But a lot of people in the world don't have that patience. So if Java makes changes like that, it is not possible for Java to survive. The reason is there are 9 million programmers, maybe it's 10 now, 9 to 10 million programmers using Java. When your language is used by 10 million people, and out of which 1 million people know where you live, you have to make decisions very differently. And so as a result, Java is moving forward, but very cautiously. Java is looking for features that are feasible, that have worked really well in other languages, and that are useful for programmers on the Java ecosystem, and they are bringing in. And so I think the growth of Java is definitely in the right direction and to the right measure, and I'm absolutely more excited for what's going on here. <laughs> so in terms of that, let's think about a few things that we can rethink about. Think of the old web. How did the old web really work and still works? Well, it's a stateless request response protocol. You make a request and you get a response. This is, how does this really work? This is like, for example, you know, we had a good dinner last night. And imagine when we met this morning, we have to reintroduce ourselves entirely. And you come over and say, hey, I'm, you know, we are so-and-so. And we reintroduce. And then we go through a verbose conversation to reestablish, and you remind me, we, we have met before, like yesterday night. And, and, and how sad that is. That is web programming, isn't it? Because every request is like a new request. Hey, how's it going? Okay, you obviously don't remember we met yesterday. This is like 10 nanoseconds earlier, right? This is not a very efficient way to do a development, and yet that's exactly what we do in this particular model. Well, a separation of concern. We are pushing HTML to the client side in the old web. When we are done with it, what do we do? We start over and push the HTML back to the client side. Now, unfortunately, there is no context. But how do we work together? If you and I talked about something yesterday, maybe we had a design discussion yesterday, 
we meet this morning, we continue right off where we left. You could even start the conversation saying, you know what, I was thinking about what you said, and I did a little prototype yesterday, and here's what I found out. And that's how the conversation starts. We don't have to reestablish the whole problem again to communicate. Wouldn't that be so nice to do it? So where is the new web really heading? And, and what I'm really excited for, and this is not new, it's been around for a good 20 years. But what really excites me is, there are ideas I could only read about. Other ideas I could only imagine about. I would read an article or a book or a blog, and then I would close, and then I would look through the window and say, how would that be so beautiful? How would that be so wonderful to be able to do that? Well, wouldn't it be so cool to be able to do this in the languages that we program every single day? And what I'm talking about here is continuations. And continuations, if you ask me, is there's one thing I'm excited the most about coming in Java in the near future? I'm gonna say that's Project Loom. Project Loom is gonna bring continuations for our use. And, and continuations is gonna make a difference to how we program the web that we program. It is gonna be a fundamental shift in the way we think, a fundamental shift in the way we program and, and that is basically why I'm so excited about continuations. So what does continuations really provide for us? Of course, we got, we're a long way from using this in Java. And, and I'm not even going to show you a web application today. But I'm going to show you uh, just a very little example of how this would feel like. What does it feel like to use continuations? So it is where you save the execution state and return to the point later in time. Now, let's think about this for a minute. Saving an ex execution state and returning to the point later in the time. <clears throat> Today, we are much better in our ability to visualize and think about it. Imagine you go to a function, and the function does some computation and returns a data to you. And so what's the result of calling this function? A piece of data that you got on your hand. Let's change this for a minute. What if this function returns a tuple back to you rather than one small data? It gives you a tuple. The, the part, first part of the tuple is the data. The second part of the tuple is a lambda expression. Oh wait, I can now take the tuple, I can use the first part as a result, and I can fire back into the lambda to execute. But wait a minute, the lambda contains a code to execute, but we know one thing about lambdas, lambdas potentially can capture the state around them. Those are called closures. So what if the tuple I return is a tuple that contains data and a closure, then I can capture the state of the program and call right back into the closure. How would that feel when we start developing code with it? Let's take a look at one example here to see how that feels. I'm gonna write a piece of code here in JavaScript. I know that, that kind of scares some people. But, but we can learn from JavaScript. I know that sounds really weird, but we really can. I think we can learn from everything, and JavaScript has done some phenomenal job moving forward. You can save this in other languages too, but I'm gonna show this here in JavaScript. So I'm gonna call a function called let's talk. So this let's talk function is a function I'm gonna call, and this function uh, I'm gonna define here, let's talk, is just a function, and right now, all I'm gonna do is return just a value of two, let's start with that. And you can see that it's returning the value of two from this call. But instead of that, I'm going to go ahead and change this slightly ever so, and I'm gonna say yield to instead of return to. And when I yield to, I'm gonna make one other small difference. I'm gonna put a little star to say it's a generator, but I'm gonna say for constant response of let's talk, and I'm going to then go ahead and print out the response right in here. So I made a very small change to this code. But where is it taking us really? I'm gonna go ahead and say init and yield one for a minute, and now I'm gonna say uh, uh, you know uh, then, and I'm going to yield a two, and then I'm going to say again, and I'm gonna yield a three, but if you notice this call now, notice the sequence of execution in this code. 
Typically, a function has a single entry point and a single exit point. Well, occasionally functions have a single entry point, but multiple exit points. But what if a function has multiple entry points? So notice in this case what we just did. We entered the let's talk function in the top. We executed init. And on line number three, we exited the function. We're out of the function on line three. And in the for loop on line number 11, we printed one which was yielded. When we go back to the loop now, we did not go back to the beginning of the function at this time. Instead, we went right back to line number four. And we executed line four, it printed then, and we exited line number five. So in this case, you have the function, but you enter here and you exit here. And then you enter here and you exit here. And then you enter here and you exit here. So it becomes a conversational state. It's like I ask you a question, you give me an answer, and I can come back tomorrow, and I can continue from where we left. I don't have to reinitialize and set the context because the conversational state is completely saved. What if we can do this across the web? What if we can start building web applications using this very idea? So this is just giving us a little bit of a look at what a continuation would look like. Obviously, there's a lot more complexity to this, and we need a lot more support by the frameworks and the libraries. But when Project Loom gets integrated into Java and becomes available as part of the JDK, we can start doing some things like this very powerfully in Java. And I'm really, honestly, looking forward to those days. I, I can't tell you how excited I am to really look for ability to write code like that where it becomes a different level of abstraction. It is an abstraction we never had on our hands, but it's going to change the way we code once we have abilities to do things like that. That changes how we work with it. Now, languages should make simple things simpler, and they should make harder things manageable. So if a language, when you're programming in the language, the language should make simple things really simple. Like for example, looping through a set of values and working with is a simple work. It shouldn't make that harder, like in the imperative style. It should really make things simple. And what is really hard should become really manageable for us. And, and that is one of the things we need. If you really look around and ask the question, why are people excited about languages like Python and Ruby and various other languages? And part of the reason for that is those languages has less ceremony. When languages have less ceremony, it really gives you a better way to work with the language. When a language has more ceremony, it really takes the, sucks the life out of us. To me, programming is a series of mini experiments. You are sitting at work and you are talking to a colleague of yours and the colleague of yours is looking at a particular uh, design and you tell your colleague, oh, you don't have to work that hard. There's a much simpler way to do this. And your colleague is like, really? How would you do this differently? Well, you could do this and do this and do this. And your colleague is like, I'm not getting it. Can you show me an example of it? Sure. And you open up Java code and realize you got to write 70 lines to do that little example. You're like, you know what? Let's go to lunch. This is not as exciting as I thought about it, right? It just sucks the life out of you. And you're like, oh my goodness, I got to write all that code to show you the simple thing. It is not as simple as I thought anymore. But why? Because the verbosity of the language really makes it hard. Now, how does communication work? Communication works when people just get it, right? You, how many times you come up and say, I hit it off with this person. I started, this is, you feel like a married couple. One person starts a sentence, the other one finishes it. And how do you feel when you have that? You're like, life is in harmony. This is what I like about programming languages. You see, I don't want to just love the programming language. I want the language to love me too. Then we are in sync. I start a sentence and the language finishes it for me. And, and now you're like, awesome. We are now getting our work done. Instead, you start a sentence and the language argues with you. And that doesn't feel right anymore. So I want to be in love with the language, but only if the language will be in love with me too. 
And, and that is one of the things I expect. A language to really get rid of this verbosity is very important. So languages must promote high level of abstraction, composability, and the declarative style. To me, these are the characteristics I want in an effective language for me to program the modern software. I want the language to have a higher level of abstraction. Abstraction is extremely important because the higher level of abstraction removes the burden on me to get the coding done. Composability is very, uh, uh, it, it rhymes, it flows, it's expressive. And the style of programming becomes a lot easier because of the declarative style. It removes the accidental complexity. Let's talk about expressiveness. Expressiveness is an extremely important characteristic of developing software. And when a language is expressive, it becomes fun to program in it and becomes easier to work with it. Talking about fun, let's talk about that real quick. So let's say I want to write a function called process. And the process function is going to take some value. Let's just say it's an integer for now. And this value integer, what am I going to do with it? I am going to say message is equal to when, and I'm going to take this uh, when as an expression and get a message out of it. So this one here is going to a, a little code written in Kotlin, but I don't want to be dealing with a series of if and else statements. Because when you start writing if and else and if and else and if and else, that code becomes horrible to read. When you look at that code, you're like, gosh, what's happening in this code, right? That becomes really hard to really understand what the code is doing. So what I want to do here is simply say, else, I don't have a clue what this data is. I'll simply say whatever, right? Whatever you give me, I'll return it from here. And then, of course, I'll just print out the message given to me. But what am I going to do here? Call process with the process with the one, a process, I'll call it process, not processor, a process with the one. And I'll pass this again, a call process with a 15. Let's just see what it's going to do for us. So in this case, if you send me a value of one, I'll simply return uh, just one, let's call this as just one. So when I execute this code, what it's going to return to us is just one when I gave one, but whatever when I gave a 15. But what if a language becomes very expressive? Like what? What if I were to say 13 to 19, and I'm going to then return right here, what do we want to return? A teen. So when I execute this code now, for one, it simply said just one, but on the other hand, for 13 to 19, it says uh, that it's going to be a teen. So look at the expressive power of the code. It becomes intuitive to read and easier to write as well. Now, what I'm showing you here is something you'll be able to do a little bit in Java 12 and a little bit more in Java 13 and even more in Java 14. And so this is the pattern matching syntax that's going to be introduced in Java. So almost everything I show you here, you can do and a little bit more and better as, as you go through in Java as well because Java is looking at all these innovation and bringing that to you so we can get better at coding in Java. But, but this is something where it removes the verbosity in the code, makes the code really expressive. Make no mistake, there is a lot more to this than we can use kind of code like this. Let's think about this a little bit more, if you will. Let's go back to this code and say, this is going to be any, not just an integer. I want to bring in any data. And so I want to pass process, and I'm going to say hello and send the hello over here. But I'm going to ask the question, what did I really get over here? So I could go ahead and add over here. Let's go ahead and say is string. And I'm going to go ahead and return a string. So when I run the code, you can see that it says a string. So it's able to find out what the type is and return that value to us. But at this point, let's switch gears and talk about Java for just one minute. I'm, going, I'm talking about Java as it is today, not as Java it is going to be in the future. Because what Java is going to be in the future is what I'll show you in just a few minutes. But let's talk about Java. In Java, 
I have a process function and that took an object, we'll call it as object n. And what am I doing in this code? I ask the question, if n is an instance of string, and then what am I going to do? Uh, I'm going to output, output, uh, I'm going to say is a string. And of course you know, it will print out is a string, isn't it? So that's not a problem. But then I want to say a string of length, and then I say plus n dot length. Will this code compile? No. no, of course not. You immediately say, Venkat, this is Java, you can't do that. So what am I going to do? Put a little parenthesis, put another parenthesis, and write code like that, isn't it? Does anyone remember what that is called? Yeah, somebody said casting. That's what Java calls it. I call it punishment. <laughs> right? It's a punishment. Why? Because you are like, why am I doing this? Because Java compiler says, because I want you to do it. I always wonder about this. I always ask this question. And I want to ask this question to everybody else too. Do you work for the compiler? Or does the compiler work for you? And I always ask this question. You know, you are sitting and writing code and you're making this work and what does Java compiler say? I want more. And you're doing more and Java compiler says, I'll be back after lunch and see how you're doing. And you're sitting there and working and working and working. And why? Because the compiler wants you to do the work. This is verbosity, isn't it? Now think about this for a minute. Imagine you're talking to somebody and you said, is it a string? Uh, yes. Get me the length, and they say, of what? And you're like, really? Right? You're going to look at them like, really? Are we going to do this? And this is not how we communicate, isn't it? Programming is communication. And what does the language say? No. We will do things very different around here. This is verbosity. And you sit there and write code for no good. And Java finally says, okay, we get it. We don't need to do this. Then what could we do instead? Well, here's an idea. What if we were to do things a little differently? Let's go back over to the code here. A string of length, and I'm gonna say n dot length. Just run that and see what it tells us. It says a string of length five. Notice, I did not waste my time and effort in performing the casting. Why? Because the language and you are in complete agreement here. You start a sentence, the language completes it for you. This is like working with a wonderful partner of yours, right? And you start a part of the sentence, the other person finishes it for you. You're in harmony. Because there's a context you share with the language. Make no mistake, if you were to go up here and say print n dot length, the language says, what are you talking about here? Unresolved length. Length is not valid anywhere you want to, right? This will become an error. You cannot do that. But this is okay. Because within that context, only in that path, it is perfectly okay because you have already paid your toll. You don't need to pay the toll one more time. And so smart casting can, like this, can remove the verbosity. The language becomes very expressive. So when, when I say I want the language to be expressive, you want to be able to talk like you're talking to an adult, not like you're talking to a child. It's because the context is something we build and we can move forward. And that is expressiveness we want to really get to. Well, you want composability. Composability can help us to really make the code fluent. And Java already does this. And this is one of the reasons why I got really excited about Java 8, because composability is part of Java 8 already. But you can take that even further in various other things. Let's look at a couple of examples of this. Suppose I start with a list of numbers. So list of, and I'm going to create some numbers, uh, numbers 1 to 10, let's say. I'll create a list of numbers. And given this list of numbers, what do I want to do? 
I'm going to say num a val result is equal to, and I want to print the result when I'm done with this. So I'm going to say over here numbers dot filter, and what am I filtering? I'm going to pass to this a function called is even. So let's write this function called is even. So I'm going to say is even takes a value n, which is an integer, and what it's going to do is return a boolean at this point. And in this case, it's going to return n mod 2 is equal to 0. So that's my is even function I'm going to return from here. But then I'm going to take that and say map, given an element, return element, let's say times 2. And then you can say dot sum to perform the total of those values. So this is something you could do in Java also. Okay, Java is not as fluent as what you see here. As you know already, you cannot call sum like this. You have to do map to double or map to int. But ignore that for a minute. Java provides you composability in various places, including the functional style of the streams. You can do this in other languages too. So composability is something we're going to carry on quite a bit moving into the future. This can remove a lot of ceremony in the code. One of the reasons that excites me about this is when I go to client sites, as I did not too long ago, I went to a client site and they said, would you look at our code and tell us what you think about it? Usually when they say it, I get scared because I look at the code, I can't understand anything. It becomes frustrating. But they had written code in Java 8 and I started reading the code and I was able to understand, even though I had no knowledge of their domain, I was able to immediately understand what the code was doing at a certain level because it was composable and I was able to walk through and say, do this, do this, do this, do this. The code begins to read like the problem statement and that becomes a lot easier to work with. So composability is a very important feature. Make no mistake though, we cannot live with composability if we don't have efficiency. It has got to be efficient too. If it's not efficient, we're not going to be here talking about it because at the end of the day, speed absolutely matters. If the speed is not going to be provided, but what is speed? Speed is not just the speed at which it runs. Efficiency is not running things faster. Efficiency is avoiding things that shouldn't be executed in the first place. So if you look at this code right here, if I, rather than printing the result, if I am going to simply say done, when I run this code, it says done. But what did it do to get produce the result over here? So if I go back here and say called over here, notice how it says called so many times and then it says done. Well, that's the result we are seeing. I can go back to this code and comment out the very last line. I don't care about the sum at this point. If I don't care about the sum, if I don't want the sum, if I'm not interested in the result, final result, then what is the point in doing all this work only to realize nobody cares about it? Think about it for a minute. The boss calls you and says, I've got an important job for you to do, and it is due on April the 15th. And the boss tells you this on January the 2nd. What do you do? You come out of the boss's office, go to your desk, and you start on this immediately, right? Heck no. You will start on it promptly on April the 14th. Because it's due the next morning, isn't it? What is that called? Efficiency. What is that called? Wisdom. In fact, you know something the boss doesn't know. You have plans to quit on March 1st. Why in the world would you do any work related to it, right? And when people ask you, you say, that's called efficiency. Why would you waste all your time doing this? When I was a kid, I was a really bad student. When I was a kid, I would see students studying for exams every day. I never understood this. But why would you study for an exam every day? Exam is four months away. A lot of things can happen between now and the exam. There could be a very heavy downpour of rain on the day of the exam. The entire school may be canceled. The professor may die before the exam. A lot of things can happen. So as a smart person, you wait until the last responsible moment, right? And you look at this and say, okay, it's not going to work in my favor. I better get ready for the exam, right? What is that called? Efficiency. Well, you want your code to be as efficient too. 
So in this case, of course, when you look at this, when I run this code, notice how inefficient it really is. It ran through all of that. Well, you know Java wouldn't do this. In Java, this is what drew me into Java. Because in Java, you don't call filter. You don't call map. You don't call reduce and methods like that. You don't call them on list. You don't call them on set. You call them on a stream. There's a reason why we call them on a stream, because streams perform lazy evaluation. If you looked at Java three years before Java was released, Java 8 was released, you will actually see those methods on the list, on the set, but they removed it because they wanted to make this lazy evaluation by default. That's the only way you can do it. In Kotlin, you have a choice. You can do this this way. As you can see, it evaluated eagerly, as you can see here, or you can go here and say as sequence. And at this point, you can say run this as a sequence rather than as eagerly. And sequences give you laziness. And as a result, you get to pick and choose. You can be one way or the other, depending on what you do. Efficiency is absolutely important. And if you ask me, well, in the past, we have been doing parallel computing a lot. My, my, my work in my uh, uh, dissertation was related to parallel computing. So I have this little liking towards parallel computing, but I'm realizing more and more, maybe we've gone overboard with it. I have a feeling that we're not gonna do as much parallel computing moving forward, because we're hitting the limits of how we can benefit from parallelism. I think moving forward, we're gonna favor asynchrony more than concurrency. This is one of the things JavaScript world did really well. If you look at Node, Node is entirely built on asynchrony, while Java has been entirely focused on sequential versus parallel, compared to synchronous versus asynchronous. So asynchronous is something I am really eager for in the for moving forward. Java is moving in this direction too. Java introduced completable futures in Java 8, but more and more, with Project Loom and other things, we're gonna be doing more asynchronous programming in Java than we ever did before. This is so much more true because moving forward with microservices, the world of microservices we live in, asynchrony becomes even more critical. But when it comes to asynchrony, I wanna emphasize that I don't want it to be seamless. I want it to be almost seamless. And the reason I emphasize almost seamless is when as a programmer, I don't want to put efforts towards writing code, but I want also not it to become so seamless, I don't even know what's happening. If you really think about what we did in the past, here's a way to think about it. Before the time of streams, what, what did streams do? When you're writing code, the uh, structure, the structure of uh, in uh, sequential code, uh, uh, so uh, the structure of parallel code uh, is very different from the structure of sequential code, right? So this is one of the things we need to be very careful about is that we had a very big difference in the past. The structure of parallel code was very different from the structure of sequential code. If you ever wrote a traditional imperative code and somebody comes to you and says, make the code parallel, your right response is to start laughing because the only other alternative is to start crying because there is no way to really make this concurrent without really turning insane. It could have turned into a monster in front of us. With streams, we had a very important distinction and that is structure of parallel code is very similar to the structure of sequential code. This was a huge benefit with streams because you write the code using streams, you turn into parallel, and the structure is very similar. What if we can do the same thing? What if the structure of a sequential, so in this case, structure of a synchronous code is the same as the structure, well, you could say is similar, to the structure of asynchronous code. How would that feel? And that is where I want to get to. 
where programming asynchrony shouldn't require a lot of effort. Why? Because if you write the code using synchronous solutions, you debug it, you test it, you reason it, and you're saying, this is great, but now I want performance out of it. With one small change, you can make, make it asynchronous. Like what? Let's think about an example right here. I've got a little example of a function, get pizza and get drink. And we want to have a pizza, we want to have a drink, we want to start a party. So I'm going to write a function called start party. Well, I will launch a party. So I'm going to say, uh, in this case, global scope, we'll call it as launch. And I'm going to launch over here. What am I going to start? I'm going to first of all call a method. So we'll say val pizza is equal to get pizza. Val drink is equal to get drink. There's a little silly example, of course. But then I'm going to print out right here. I'm going to print out pizza and I'm going to print out the drink and both of those here. And of course, I want to wait for a little bit for that to finish. So we'll go ahead and say sleep of about five seconds and run this. When I run this code, you'll be able to see very clearly that get pizza is going to hold our thread for five seconds. And then it's going to come to get drink, which is going to take five seconds. And then we will see the print and the drink being printed. So let's see if that's actually true. Let's go ahead and run this here. So I'm going to just run the command right here. And what does it do at this point? So I'm going to launch. Let's go ahead and spell it correctly. L-A-U-N-C-H. There you go. So try this again. So this time around, when I run this code, what does it do? Right there, you can see the time difference, right? The delay is significant. When you run this code, you can see there is the get pizza five seconds later, get drink comes through. And then that took again five seconds. But I want to run this asynchronously. I mean, if you're starting the party, why would you want to wait for the pizza to arrive? And while the pizza is getting cold, you want to wait for the drink to arrive. That's not the way we run party. Nobody will show up our party if we do this this way, right? So you ask one buddy to go get pizza, another buddy to go get drink, and you get started when, when they arrive, potentially even earlier as one arrives. So how do I do that? Well, what if I can make this structure the same? I don't want to modify the structure of the code. I'm going to keep it exactly the same structure. But all I'm going to do is simply say async. And I'm going to say, run that part asynchronously for me. So notice the structure is absolutely the same. Just a little difference. Uh, what appears cosmetic to us, a huge amount of change behind the scenes, but not in our code. And then I'm going to await and await for the pizza. And I'm going to await for the drink as well. Now, when I go back and run this code this time around, look at the time. And notice we start both of them at the same time. And we didn't wait for one to finish to start the other. And we can send them off asynchronously to run. And as a result, we could be moving forward without, we're talking about non-blocking. So what if our code can be non-blocking? We don't have to wait for things to finish. That becomes absolutely easier to work with. And this is again a direction that Java is moving. Now, wait a minute, I showed you things you couldn't do in Java today, and yet we are able to see that happening in other languages. So the obvious question is, how do we prepare for the future? How do we get to the future and, and be ready for these things? And the answer to that is, is the following. I came across the study which was pretty intriguing, and, and the study was essentially the following. They, this is a, a study conducted in Chicago, and they took children four to six years of age, and they, there were two groups of children. The first group of children were children exposed to only one language. Their parents spoke a language, their teachers spoke the same language, their circle of community they went around spoke the same language. So these were children exposed to only one language. The second group of children were children exposed to multiple languages. I'm not saying those children spoke multiple languages, but they were just exposed to multiple languages. Their parents spoke one language, but maybe their nanny spoke a different language. 
Maybe their teachers spoke a different language. Or maybe their friends they hang around with spoke a different language. And when they took these two group of children, what the researcher did is the researchers took objects and they planted an object. Here's an example of how, how this works. Imagine for a minute that imagine that you have, you know, a, a, a imagine this is a clicker for a minute. And imagine there's a clicker here and a clicker here in the back. And imagine you, where you're sitting is one of the child. And the researcher asked the question, how many clickers do you see, for example? And it turned out, when this question was asked, the child who was exposed to one language said the child is able to see two of those objects. But the same exact question asked to a child exposed to multiple languages, the child will look at the objects and say, well, internally think about this and say, aha, the person is asking how many objects are we seeing? And the, and the child immediately thinks in the, through the eyes of the person asking the question, and obviously the person asking the question is able to see the object in front of them, but not the one behind them. And so rather than saying two, those children will only say one. And this was very intriguing for them because the children exposed to multiple languages was able to communicate better with the person that's asking the question than the children who spoke only one language. Now, this is children who are four to five years old. Then they took infants. These were kids who couldn't even speak yet. And they did the experiment on those children. And they were surprised that the same pattern exists with those children too. And this made me realize when we are exposed to a diverse set of languages, we think very differently compared to when we are exposed to only one language predominantly. It, whatever that language is, whether we are programming Java or we are programming Python or we are programming JavaScript, but if that's the only language we ever program, I think we are at a serious disadvantage. So one of the ways is the following. The amount of time we need to learn a new concept is inversely proportional to the number of diverse ideas we've been exposed to. The more diverse ideas we have been exposed to, we learn new ideas very quickly. The fewer diverse ideas we've been exposed to, the longer it actually takes for us to really adapt to changes that we see in the future. So the obvious question to ask is, how do we learn the languages very quickly? Because to me, the value that I provide as a developer to my business is in adapting to ideas very quickly and delivering value with it. Compared to another developer who may have a lot of struggle really learning those ideas and getting proficient with it. So how do I really accelerate my learning and applying in the future? And to me, uh, one, of, one of the ways to do that is to learn different languages, but not to use them all. And not to put them all in production. In fact, I would argue, I don't want to see a lot of different languages in my production code. That's not going to be fun to maintain it. I want to learn all these languages, not to use them on my production code, but to be able to adapt to the changes quickly and easily as the language that we already use evolves in the future. So when I'm learning what's happening in other languages, when I see my own language that I use every day changes, my time to adapt to it is a lot less because I've actually taken time to really get exposed to it, play with it, and, and experiment and experience it, and that saves a lot of time and effort as well. So my, my recommendation is don't wait for the future because it's already here, and we can actually experience it right now, and we don't have to wait for that date. Thank you, that's all I have. for questions and as usual when that uh, I will ask you to give this present to the person who will ask the best question. Questions? Very cool. When can I have one question, probably not for this gift, but uh, how about memory model of Java? Will it have some evolution in the future? Can you compare it with other languages? How do you feel this? Right, really good question. And and my my guess at this point is no. And the reason I say no is that's a legacy. It is incredibly difficult to change something as fundamental as that in a language. Um, 
So I'm going to say most likely not. We, we may have better abstractions on top of the memory model. And in honesty, I would say the memory model is pretty strong. The problem is not the, the memory model. I think the problem is exposing that to us. Um, I, I truly believe that the concurrency model in Java is the assembly language of concurrent programming. Assembly is still there, we use it widely, but many of us in this room, I'm hoping, don't program in assembly every day. We leave it to the people who are brave enough to do that and tackle every day, and I'm always thankful for them to do it. In the same way, I think programming at that level of concurrency should be left to libraries and, uh, and abstractions, and, and we shouldn't be doing it at that level. This is one of the reasons why things like uh, Project Loom and Fiber are, are so critical, because they remove that burden from us so we can focus on the application level behavior and not have to deal with the Java memory model. Uh, so A, it's legacy, and so it cannot change so easily, and B, I think we, what we need is a better abstraction. Uh, so, so, so if you want to change the memory model, there's not gonna be much success with it, I think, but at the same time, I think there's solutions into saying, you don't have to deal with it, deal with a higher level of abstraction. Thank you. Good question. Uh, Please. I have a question. Uh, Yes. So, so the question is, what language should we really look at to uh, learn different paradigm? Um, I, I would say, uh, draw, a, draw a circle. I, I'm not going to say the specific languages here, but I'll say the type of languages. And the reason I don't want to say specific languages, uh, to a certain extent, I would say that's a disservice to name them that way. Uh, so instead of saying what languages, I would say what types of languages. So one of the things, I, I program in about 15 languages today. And the reason I learn in 15 languages, program in 15 languages, but I want to learn more, is because I'm so eager to know the nuances and differences. Uh, so I would say definitely get comfortable with a really good statically typed language. I, when I say really good statically typed language, I'm not saying Java, because Java is not statically typed enough, for example. So explore a static typed language, but also explore a dynamically typed language. A lot of people fear using dynamic type languages. I think that fear can go away if we spend enough time getting exposed to it. Also spend some time on functional style programming languages. Uh, to really get exposed to uh, a purely functional language can help us to really change the way we think. So I would take one from that area. I will also look for a language that offers incredible support for metaprogramming. Uh, I would then pick a language that has a really powerful support for uh, programming concurrency. So, so typically what I do is I don't gravitate towards languages. Instead, I get, get gravitate towards features that are predominant in some languages. And that's what I want to really learn. As an example, um, I had spent a few years programming with Erlang's concurrency. And when Scala came out, all I had to do was to realize, aha, even though Erlang was a dynamically typed language, and Scala was a static language, the Scala's concurrency model was very much like the Erlang's concurrency model. So that became very easy for me to learn, even though the language was not the same typing, it was easy to learn and adapt to it. And so that's what I would say is, same thing with Ruby, I had spent time learning Ruby's metaprogramming. I got really fascinated about metaprogramming in, in Groovy, sorry, in Ruby, and when and I got exposed to Groovy, I realized how similar Groovy's metaprogramming was with Ruby's metaprogramming, and that became a lot easier to adapt to it. So, so I always look for these, uh, you know, what is the speciality of a language, and, and look for these specialities and learn them across multiple languages. Please. Uh, you mentioned uh, about that uh, uh, multiple processors and multiple cores influence the programming. Do you expect a breakthrough in the quantum computing uh, in the next decades? Uh, is it worth like to invest some time uh, in that? I, I, I would say absolutely yes. And, and the reason I would say is, I'll quote a, a wonderful saying by Thomas Huxley here, and his statement is, learn everything about something and something about everything. So, so I think it is definitely very important to do that. And, and the reason is, so in, in, you know, in my uh, career so far, in about 35 years I've been in the field, what I've noticed is 
I, I, I always do this. I kind of sit back one day, maybe I'm in a train or something, and I just kind of let my memory go to my past. And I remember the times when I clearly picked a certain technologies and they were, they caught on like wildfire. And, and we've been using them very heavily. But I also very clearly remember technologies that I learned and they never went anywhere. Um, and then technologies I did not learn and, and thankfully they never went anywhere. Uh, but even the technologies that I learned and they never went anywhere, I can tell you there's manifestations of that in the future in another context. And, and to me, when I apply certain ideas from the past, I'm always like, wow, I'm able to think this way because I got exposed to it back then even though I didn't use it. So from that point of view, I think we absolutely have to invest in it. If it becomes really great and, and, and has a chance to do it, I think we would have really gained from it. And even if not, I think we'll still gain from it because it may not be that, but it's going to be in some other manifestation in the future. Because ideas don't actually die. Uh, products die, libraries die, but ideas kind of resurface in other forms in the future. I think we can definitely benefit from that.